Business Commission, we're a cross-party group of MPs from all four nations of the UK and business people who've come together to scrutinise the UK's new trading relationships. You can find out more about our work by going to our website, where you can also discover how you can submit evidence. Today, we are taking a first look at the economic impact of our new trading circumstances. And I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our witnesses this morning. And I'd be grateful if you could just introduce yourselves, uh, starting with you, Vicky. Hello, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this. I'm Vicky Price. I'm a board member of the Center for Economics and Business Research and a former joint head of the Government Economic Service. Thank you very much. And Thomas. Uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm Thomas Sampson. I'm an associate professor in economics at the London School of Economics, uh, where my research focuses on trade and globalization. Thank you very much indeed. We are also going to be joined when he is able to log in to by Julian Jessup from the IEA. Um, we're very grateful to all of you for giving up your time this morning to share your expertise and insights with us. We have, as ever, a lot of ground to cover, and I'd be really grateful, colleagues, for succinct questions and to our witnesses for succinct answers. Um, please don't feel it's necessary for all of you to answer every question, but if you do want to catch my eye, then the best thing is just to wave, because I'm uh, looking at you on the screen. Each of the questioners has got um, seven minutes to cover both the questions and the answers you're going to give so we can fit everybody in. Can I start by just asking you very briefly to um, say whether the economic impact of the end of the transition period so far has come as a surprise to you or was what we have seen inevitable? Perhaps I could start with you, Vicky. Thank you. Uh, not a great surprise, uh, frankly. Of course, what we did see, certainly on the trade and manufacturing uh, sides of the economy, um, what had been happening before has been quite a lot of stockpiling. We had seen quite a, a sort of vol volatile behaviour there, depending on whether businesses thought we were going to get a deal or we were going to have a no deal. So there was quite a lot of attempts to um, plan ahead of any disruptions that might exist post-transition period and uh, the, the truth is that indeed that stockpiling did mean that quite a lot of trade and production was done towards the end of the year 2020 uh, and that was followed of course by uh, a, a, a reduction in activity both in relation to manufacturing production itself which sort of went into a bit of a slowdown even though it had been recovering for some time but also, of course, in relation to trade. So no great surprise from that point of view. No great surprise that the type of agreement that was reached still left loads and loads of questions unanswered, in particular in relation to the extra costs associated with trade. So though we did get tariff-free agreement, it does not mean that it was cost-free. And that has been very obvious in what we've seen since. Uh, so from that side, not great surprise, but what is a real disappointment is the fact that services have moved so slowly in relation to at least achieving some sort of agreement in the various areas that are being discussed at present, including the financial sector, where we are really in limbo in, another, in a number of areas, which I think are going to affect trade, growth and uh, business confidence for some time to come. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thomas. Broadly speaking, I agree with Vicky. It's, it's, it's not a surprise that, you know, as, as new trade barriers have come in at the start of January, there has been substantial disruption to UK trade. Some of that is the inevitable consequence of changing uh, trade relationships and of the form of trade agreement we have, which is, you know, provides for tariff and quota free access, but does little to reduce non tariff barriers. What perhaps isn't, you know, wasn't completely inevitable, I think some, some of the extensive disruption we saw in January reflected the very short period that businesses had to prepare to implement the deal. The deal was agreed eight days before it was implemented. And I think you know, that short time span contributed to additional disruption, which didn't need to 
occur. If there had been a longer period before the deal was implemented and more of a phase in period, some of the initial disruption could have been avoided. But a lot of it is the inevitable consequence of the uh, change in trading relations. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Julian, welcome. Uh, I don't know if you heard the question. The question I was just asking you briefly to comment Hmm. on uh, to start with is whether the economic impact of the end of the transition period so far has come as a surprise to you, or whether it was to be expected was inevitable. Uh, well, I certainly think that some negative impact was inevitable. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, if you raise uh, barriers to trade, then there's clearly going to be some sort of economic hit. Uh, and I agree with with both Vicky and, and, and Thomas on the on the essential facts. But um, I'd actually put a, a more positive spin on it in the sense that the the impact does not seem to have been as big as as many people feared. Um, I mean, earlier in the year, there are reports of exports to the EU potentially falling by as much as 68 percent year on year in January. Uh, In fact, they only fell about 40 percent. Now, obviously, that is a big hit, but um, can partly be explained by the earlier stockpiling. And since then, we've seen a pretty healthy recovery in February. Um, Exports are still lower than they were a year ago. But of course, that was pre-COVID. They're also lower than a year ago in terms of exports to the rest of the world as well. Uh, And on top of that, we've had further evidence of a recovery in March. Um, I'm one of these sort of obsessive geeks who who looks at things like, you know, French customs websites, and they suggest that things are already back to back to normal. So, um, yes, there there has been a hit, but I think it's been less than most people anticipated. Um, I think the net impact will turn out to be less than, for example, the 0.5 percent of GDP that the uh, the OBR has, has penciled in for the hit in the first quarter. Um, that said, and there are obviously lots of caveats here, and if you know, I, I'll mention some of them now. I know we'll pick up on these later. Um, we only have figures on on goods trade. We don't know quite what's happening to, to services trade, and that's where a lot of the unknowns are. Um, there's plenty of evidence that that smaller, medium sized companies are suffering more than big companies, which I think is a is a valid concern. And of course, although people say that Brexit is done, we still have lots of you know, transitional arrangements in place. The UK itself isn't imposing all of the border checks and SBS controls it might have expected to do. So um, the jury is clearly going to be out for, for some time. But actually, I think the evidence we have so far is, is reassuring. OK, thank you very much uh, indeed. Right. I'm now going to turn to Claire Hanna. Claire. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to ask a fairly broad question that will build on the question um, from Hillary and ideally would like to hear from each of you. So if you don't mind keeping your answer to to, uh, fairly short, and I know we can pick up with with colleagues, just want to ask, what do you expect to be um, the medium to long term uh, impact of the TCA? And I suppose, when do you hope to be able to be more confident about those predictions um, given issues around COVID stockpiling and, and teething troubles and so on. And maybe if we'll just go in the same order, if you don't mind starting, Vicky Price. Sure. Um, there have been quite a lot of estimates of what happens when you reduce um, the ability to trade in a frictionless way with other countries. And uh, the main impact, of course, is at the end of the day in reducing competitiveness um, and reducing productivity. And that's basically what everyone is putting in their models, the ones anyway that are looking long term. Julian may disagree, Um, but I can mention, for example, what the OBR has produced uh, in its latest forecast, which is that the long term loss um, of productivity in the UK will be something like 4%, which is higher than the Brexit, sorry, than the COVID loss, which they expect to be about 3%. So it's really quite substantial. You add three and four and you get 7%. So that's quite significant. The other interesting thing that we need to do, bear in mind, you asked about uh, how soon are we likely to see it. Uh, Bank of England forecasts suggested that we're likely to see a lot of that impact in the first three years. And that's pretty worrying, especially as we'll be coming out of the pandemic and we'll want to see as much growth as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thomas Sampson, if, if you could pick up, and I know you've specialised in, in, in living standards and I suppose maybe the, the, the impact on, uh, on, on, on cost of living and um, on consumers, if, if possible, to touch on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the OBR estimate of a 4% long-term loss, which Vicky mentioned, is a, is a reasonable central estimate of kind of what economists think the long-run effect might be. 
Um, when, when I say long run there, typically people think it might take up to 10 years for the full effects to bed in. So you know, it, it will be a considerable amount of time before we're fully able to evaluate what the effects were. The other point that is worth mentioning there is you know, that, that OBR estimate, it doesn't come from a piece of analysis that, that they've done themselves. What they've done is taken an average of external estimates. And if you look at the, the, the external estimates, there's actually a very large range in those estimates that they've averaged between 1.8% at the low end and 10% at the high end. So what that point points to is that there is considerable uncertainty, even within the kind of geeks who do these models, about exactly how big the effects will be. Um, and I think it's worth just two kind of two two factors that contribute to that uncertainty. One is that we don't we still don't know exactly what form Brexit is going to take in the sense that some of the expected losses are coming from regulatory divergence, which leads to higher future trade barriers with the EU. And we don't yet know the extent to which um, the government is actually going to choose to diverge from EU regulation. So there's still something to kind of play for in that sense, which will affect how big the long run costs are. The other is that a lot of the uncertainty comes from different stances on how important the effects of trade on productivity are. And essentially, if, if, if you think trade has big effects on productivity, you end up with much bigger effects of the long run costs. And that's an area where there isn't really a strong academic consensus and the evidence is a bit more, bit more mixed. So 4% is a good central estimate, but there is a lot of variation um, around that. And we will only kind of learn slowly how, how you know, how big the effects actually turn out to be. Thanks very uh, much. Julie, Julie yes. you, were, you were more optimistic. I, um, I, I am more optimistic. I mean, first, we're just picking up on something that, that Thomas mentioned. I, I think that there's sometimes too much emphasis placed on the, on the OBR work, because as he said, it, it's not actually new work. It's, a, it's a, basically a, a, a literature review of what others have done. Uh, and the OBR itself, it's described as a broad based assumption, broad brush assumption, rather than a sort of firm, firm prediction. Um, clearly, you, you can get different answers depending which assumptions you make and, and which models you put those assumptions into. Um, I personally think the assumption of a, of a 4% long term hit is, is too high for, for a number of reasons. I mean, you can, you can go through the chain. I mean, it, it assumes for a start that um, there's a the increased trade barriers have a far bigger cost than I think is, is actually likely. And that increase in cost then has a far bigger impact on overall trade flows than I, I think is likely. And then on top of that, uh, there's a strong link assumed between the impact on trade and the impact on, on productivity. So I, I think at, at every stage, the, um, the impact is exaggerated. And of course, there are lots of other things going on as well. I think some of the benefits of Brexit are, are underestimated, particularly the benefit of doing free trade deals with the rest of the world and, uh, and all the other stuff that Brexit is about, including the opportunity for, for better regulation. So um, I think that 4% figure is, is too pessimistic. Now, as we all know, only time will tell. But so far, I'd argue that the evidence has been pretty positive. So um, despite a very rocky start where, as others have said, we, we sort of launched into the end of the transition period without a clear idea of what was happening, um, you know, that there hasn't been as big a fall in trade as, as some people feared. Uh, and the other important thing is that a lot of this, is, of course, is about investment and, and confidence and things like that. And um, there has been a marked improvement in not just um, public sentiment towards Brexit, but also sort of business sentiment. Um, Brexit concerns have dropped way down the list. Um, at least some of the impact that the, the OBR was warning about, they themselves reckoned would already have come through. I think they said something like um, you know, 1.6% of the 4% hit has already come through because of the weakness of investment over the last few years. But if investment now recovers strongly because things aren't as bad as people feared, and in particular, if the EU continues to make as big a mess of things as it is around the uh, rollout of the, the COVID vaccines, then I think a lot of that lost investment will actually come back so it's going to be very hard to work out what the counterfactual is going to be. Um, but I suspect that the, the overall impact of Brexit is, is going to be a lot less in some areas than people feared and actually a bigger positive in other areas as well. Yeah, I, I know colleagues will, 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 will pick up because you mentioned some of those factors in the medium to long term, like um, change in regulations and, and rest of the world. Just very briefly, when, when do you think you'll be able to... Um, I, I suppose, uh, keep the receipts on, on predictions. How long do you think the impacts will take to work through? Um, well, I think they'll, 
different impacts will come through at, at, at different speeds. So, for example, any benefit from new trade deals to the rest of the world, that, that that's clearly some years off before anything substantial will come through here. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, smarter regulation, well, we're starting to see some uh, some benefits straight away. I mean, they're, they're, they're relatively small things and in the bigger scheme of things that don't have a big macroeconomic impact, but you could point to things like the the, the tampon tax and the, the DAC6 uh, regulations in accountancy as well. Um, the main one I'll point to is the... Uh, is the vaccine story. Now, I know that that's not necessarily anything to do with Brexit. We, we could have um, you know, developed, approved and rolled out the vaccines you know, just as quickly if we'd remained fully a member of the EU because of the exceptions that the rules allowed. But I still think it's significant that Brexit Britain was the only country to diverge from that. Well, I know, I know colleagues okay. will, will, will pick up on that. I'll hand back to you, Chair. Thank you. Claire, thank you very much uh, indeed. Philippa Whitford. Philippa. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. If I could start uh, with uh, Thomas Sampson and then Vicky and then Julian, if they've something to add. Uh, do you think that there will actually be a change in the structure of the UK economy as a result of the changes in trade barriers? For example, while it's not kind of getting the publicity of the impact of SPS checks, obviously increased trade barriers, the risk of tariffs from rules of origin on things like car manufacturing and pharmaceuticals, where multinational companies have used the UK as a gateway to the EU. You know, do you see these, you know, everyone is moaning about friction, but do you think there would be big structural changes in the key sectors within the UK economy? I think that inevitably when you have a change of this magnitude, it is likely to have kind of ripple effects that do in some way change the structure of the UK economy. I don't at this stage feel that we can predict exactly how the structure will change with, with much um, confidence, just because, you know, though you know, Brexit is one shock that will affect the decisions firms make. There is obviously a lot else that is changing in the world at the moment. COVID is the most obvious example, but if you, you know, to take the car sector, which you mentioned, you know, the, the big issue for the car industry in the next few years is going to be the kind of race to corner the market in electric vehicles. Now, being outside of the EU, add some additional frictions that UK-based companies would face in, in doing that, but it's probably, you know, the, the less important shock than thinking about, you know, what, what kind of battery production facilities do you, do you have? So kind of understanding exactly how Brexit feeds into that is, is, is rather complex. In broad terms, though, you know, I think it is right that the UK's business model for a lot of the last 40 years has been partly that foreign companies can come to the UK, they can invest in a place with, you know, a high-skilled workforce, good rule of law that is English speaking, and they can use it as a base to serve European markets. That is not going to be as attractive a proposition anymore. We've already seen evidence that that is starting to divert uh, new FDI uh, projects. And I think that you will, you will see less use of the UK as an export platform than we would otherwise have done. Thank you. Uh, Vicky, anything you would like to add to that? Yes, um, uh, really interesting. You focused on the manufacturing mostly and the areas where we have been quite strong, including pharmaceuticals, of course. A number of those uh, sectors did quite well during the pandemic and we have to bear that in mind. Not car manufacturing, uh, but certainly pharmaceuticals, life sciences uh, have done well. Um, but there is, uh, first of all, whether we're going to be looked at again as a gateway to Europe, which is unlikely to be the case, uh, unless we change the relationship we have at present. There's always the possibility of having some better arrangements so that things can be eased and the rules of origin can be looked at again in terms of the way the requirements are being put on firms right now. So things could be simplified. And we're seeing a little bit of that happening already. So hopefully there'll be some movement, but we don't know whether that will be the case. I mean, what I worry about more is what's going to happen to the rest of the economy, because after all, uh, we have a, a trade deficit on uh, the good side anyway. Uh, we have a surplus on the services side. Uh, that surplus may well diminish and diminish quite significantly. We've already seen movement of funds and up to a point people. But the question is whether new investment is going to go somewhere else rather than come here. And then you have all those restrictions that are there now as non-tariff barriers that were mentioned by, by Thomas anyway, 
And those non-tariff barriers uh, affect our tourism industry, for example, our airline sector. It's quite uh, uh, useful to remember that because we've left the single market, we no longer have those cabotage rules, uh, or at least we're not covered by that. In other words, you know, before you could uh, have, uh, you know, a lorry or a holier service could just uh, take goods from here. So it affects our goods trade as well. Goods from here go to, to Europe and then have three trips when they come back. Uh, so it meant that you could carry um, uh, produce to other places of, in Europe and therefore do reasonably well out of that, you know, full load, come back again with a full load. And then foreign uh, firms as well could do that three times in the UK and they won't be able to do that anymore. You can only do it once. Similarly with airlines, uh, that's gone too. And yet you can see the huge advantage to the consumers, the huge advantage to prices, the huge advantage to just-in-time production from having that type of service, being able to function as it did before. And I think that's going to have not only an impact on the service sector, but also an impact on the manufacturing sector too, which relies so much for uh, on, on those services being freely available, easily available, and not costing that much to be able to export their products. I mean, as you say, the just-in-time supply chain uh, model that has been there is likely to change significantly. Uh, Julian, would you like to add anything uh, with regards kind of the UK as a gateway or that kind of multinational manufacturing? Yeah, well, just just very briefly this time. Um, I mean, first of all, anything that changes trading arrangements, whether that's to make them freer or, or less free, will have some impact on the, the structure of the economy. Um, changes in trading relationships usually sort of create jobs in some sectors, destroy jobs in others. And I think that there will clearly be some impact. Um, I think it is still too early to say exactly what that will be. Um, I would remain relatively optimistic for, for essentially two reasons. First of all, I think the economic impact of the, the increase in trade barriers with the EU, uh, although it's negative, will not be as negative as, as some people fear. Um, and, and the second point is that Brexit, of course, isn't just about UK EU trade. There's a lot of other moving parts as well, including our trade with the with the rest of the world and, and what happens on, on regulation. So um, there'll be forces pushing in all sorts of different directions. But I think overall, in a few years time, we might look back at this and say, well, actually, not quite what was the fuss about, because clearly in some areas, <laughs> there's still a substantial shock. Um, but overall, I don't think the impact will be as great as people think or fear. So you think rest of the world trade will actually compensate for a reduction in EU trade? Obviously, um, that's I, not what most predictions are. Yes, I don't actually think that that's necessarily the right way to look at it, because even, even if that there is a small net negative from what happens to trade, there could be that could be offset by positives elsewhere in terms of regulation and investment and that sort of thing. Uh, but I suspect we'll get pretty close. I think, you know, in, in the short term, there'll be a hit to the UK economy from less trade with the EU, um, if we choose to see half a percent as a, as a figure um, in the short term. Um, but, you know, broadly offset in the longer term with freer trade with the rest of the world. Um, remember that Europe is, is already becoming less important to us simply because of the, the slower growth of the, of the European economy. Uh, the growth is going to be in the rest of the world. Uh, and over the long run, I, I don't see why, a, you know, a reduction in barriers to trade with the rest of the world can't offset the impact of an increase in trade barriers with Europe. Vicky, you want to come back, but yes. I'm running just out of very time. Briefly, very, yeah. very briefly, just to say that most FTAs and most agreements we're likely to strike with others will not include services. Uh, so that isn't going to compensate for what we may be losing in, in Europe. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Philippa, Jeff. thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm now going to turn to Andrew Ballheimer. Andrew. Andrew, you're on mute. So you just need to unmute so we can hear you. There you are. Apologies about that, my incompetence. So uh, I was just thanking you each for attending sort of the session, um, for being so open. Um, I've got a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, we've obviously had sort of the overview of the impact of the TCA on the economy. Um, obviously, sort of, the, 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 sort of the period post-execution of the TCA sort of overlapped with the impact of the pandemic. If you back out the, the pandemic, how does the picture look in terms of the impact you know, of, the, of the agreement on the economy? Perhaps um, start with Thomas and then take each of you in turn, if that's okay. Yeah, so obviously one, you know, one question is, 
to what extent can we separate the effects of Brexit from the effects of, of COVID? Because we have these two, two major shocks going on at the same time. I think, you know, I'm, I'm fairly confident that we can, can do that with a couple of caveats. One is that you just need to be a little bit careful about interpreting the headline figures and making sure you're kind of looking at the right source of information to do it. Uh, the other is that we will be able to answer that question better over time as more data becomes available. Um, you know, the reason we can separate the two is essentially that their, their incidence is very different along a number of dimensions, both in terms of you know, the, the timing, but also which sectors are exposed and which parts of the world are exposed. So, for example, during the uh, initial first wave of the uh, of COVID back in the spring of last year, we saw trade with the EU and with non-EU both collapse, but they kind of collapsed by similar amounts. And then goods trade at least came back quite um, strongly. So, you know, what that suggests is that by comparing how UK trade with the EU evolves relative to UK trade with the non-EU in the short term, that is a useful way to kind of separate out the Brexit effect from the um, COVID effect. The area where it is potentially more problematic at the moment is in uh, services. Uh, services trade, UK services trade collapsed when COVID hit and hasn't bounced back yet in the way uh, goods trade has for you know, obvious reasons with the shutdown of international travel. Um, and because of that, I think it is going to be longer before we start to get a sense of how the TCA is actually playing out for services sector. At the, at the moment, there's simply no data to speak to that at all, but we're going to have to wait until kind of the services part of the economy and international travel reopens to have any sense of what's going on and how binding a constraint some of these non-tariff barriers are for services firms. So that's something you know, I, I feel that I can't really speak to at all yet. Vicky? I think you're on mute as well, actually. I did press it. I pressed yeah. it, but it didn't work. Yeah, Sorry about that's it. Good. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, well, uh, it's obviously quite difficult to separate the two, the pandemic and uh, and and Brexit. And, and indeed, um, what we did see is a lot of stockpiling ahead of Brexit, which you can clearly identify as a Brexit issue. Um, but what others have done looking at the way in which trade has evolved over the last few years, in particular since the referendum, had been to uh, look at what other countries had done, what equivalent countries would have done in relation to trade and growth of trade during that period, and found that, in fact, the UK was lagging behind anyway. So quite a lot of the impacts of Brexit have already been built into the system. The, the Centre for European Reform estimates that we've seen trade with the EU go down by something like 10% since 2016, and that is likely to remain. And there's been further fall, of course, uh, since um, the end of the transition period. Again, what they estimate is that trade is running at 3.5% below where it would have been if we had voted to stay and if there had not been Brexit. Um, so that's where we are at present. That's the closest we could possibly get. So they use an algorithm which uh, looks at what equivalent countries, two sets of equivalent countries would have done. And I'm pretty confident that that's the outcome we have at present. But again, you know, March may be a little bit different and they might revise that, but a lot of the loss and the supply chain issues that we we're discussing before have already filtered through the system. So we are much less able to take advantage of whatever happens in the future as a result of the Brexit uh, agreement than would have been the case otherwise, or at least Brexit than would have been the case otherwise. You. Julian, I assume you have a different insight. Um, well, I think actually both Thomas and Vicky have made very good points. I, I would just, it's, again, look at them slightly differently. In terms of the, the impact, there is definitely a difference between what's happened to our trade with the EU and the, the rest of the world, particularly over the last couple of months. And, and that is largely a, a Brexit impact rather than COVID, of course, but, but, but not entirely. Um, of course, COVID has, has hit the uh, European economy more and in different ways than much of the, the rest of the world. And if you look at the, you know, the growth forecasts of people like the IMF and the OECD, they've revised them up significantly recently for the UK and the, and the US in particular, but, but not so much for, for Europe. So I think part of any underperformance of trade with the EU that we might see over the next year or so might partly be due to the relative weakness of the EU economy. Um, even though if, if you compare, though, the, 
exports to the UK, uh, exports to the EU and to the rest of the world, they're not actually that much different at the moment. If you look at February, UK exports to the EU were down 12.5%. UK exports to the rest of the world were down 8.6%. Um, so that the gap that opened up in January largely seems to have closed in February. And I expect, as I say, the March numbers to be better. Um, I think Vicky makes a, a very good point about some of the, um, the the counterfactual analysis that others have been doing, the so-called doppelganger models. And um, I, th I think most sensible people would, would agree that the UK economy has underperformed in a number of ways since the referendum uh, in terms of investment and, and, and trade as a result of the uncertainty created by Brexit. But but where I would differ is the, the assumption that that is permanent and or will only get worse. Um, I think a lot of it simply because it was to do with uncertainty you know, people were fearing, uh, you know, the, the worst case, no deal as a, as a possibility where uh, the economic hit would have been a lot greater. And, you know, people were worried about all sorts of things around Brexit that actually haven't happened. Um, I suspect that some of those losses will be will be recouped. We're already seeing, of course, the you know, sterling starting to recover as well in, in the currency market. So um, I think you know, some of the hit that has happened so far will actually be reversed as businesses and consumers get more confident that Brexit isn't as bad as they feared. Thank you. Question for, for, for Becky, if that's okay. Um, in your own comments, um, there was mentioned that the TCA left a number of questions unanswered. You know, obviously, it's in many ways a holding treaty. Um, as, we look for, you know, as we look forward, you know, are there two or three things that... that you know, if we get agreed, they would make a material you know, positive impact on the economy and trading picture. Obviously, you know, there have to be things that are practical and consistent with Brexit. Yes, uh, but the interesting thing has to be very, just very quick yeah, in right. terms okay. of the list. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, the the interesting thing is that the UK has has not really imposed any serious controls of anything coming into the UK. Uh, the exports from the EU still flowing in quite easily. So that's a, a, a positive thing. The question is what's going to happen when that uh, has to change uh, eventually. So if we can uh, maybe make that a little bit more uh, you know, permanent, that would be quite nice uh, with the agreement of the EU. And maybe it can be reciprocated the other way. I think that would be quite a substantial improvement. The second one is on, on services, where uh, on financial services, as we know, uh, we uh, are nowhere really near having any equivalents. Uh, and of course, qualifications for people, travel arrangements, all these areas need to be looked at again. We have made some agreement on data adequacy, um, where again, uh, you know, there was a serious worry would have affected loads of smaller firms as well. Um, but of course, what we have done there is we have completely accepted EU rules and it is under review anyway, or will be under review. So. Uh, maybe we can follow that. Maybe we will accept some EU regulations uh, or uh, after all, in order to be able to get some agreements through that make life easier for businesses. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. Um, right. Um, Caroline Lucas. Caroline. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, uh, just sort of really following on, I guess, uh, both uh, Vicky and, and Thomas in particular have spoken a bit already about non-tariff barriers. And I just wanted to explore that a little bit further to ask you that given that the TCA maintains zero tariffs, are projected um, economic losses predominantly caused by, by non-tariff barriers? Could you just say a bit more about that, maybe starting with Thomas? Yes, I mean, I, I think that that's absolutely Right, the uh, the barriers that are introduced as a result of the of the TCA are non-tariff barriers. Now, you know the difficulty, kind of, we trade economists always face when talking about non-tariff barriers is to explain exactly what they are because it's a it's a kind of broad catch-all category that's really just anything that's not a tariff. And whereas, you know, tariffs just a, a tax, and that's easy to understand. Non-tariffs are so many different things. So what you know, what do we think are the most important non-tariff barriers that are introduced by the TCA? Um, well, it's things like you know, the, the customs checks, the formalities you have to go through at the border. It's the additional regulatory red tape that UK firms will now have to go through to prove that their products meet the appropriate standards to be sold in the EU. Um, then it's also it's things like needing to satisfy rules of origin to show that you know, a product is actually made in Britain in order to be able to have tariff-free access. Because if, if you don't meet rules of origin, then you're back to facing... Uh, tariffs again, so the tariffs still matter from that perspective. And then, you know, for, for services, which Vicky has rightly pointed out, are um, you know a um, very important export sector for the UK. 
it's often, you know, it's, it's more direct forms of loss of market access. So it's the loss of passporting rights and so far, you know, even equivalence arrangements for financial services. And then for a lot of other kind of business services, but also for say touring musicians or for the fashion industry, what's really important is the ability to be able to go to the EU on kind of for a short period to work without having to go through the whole visa uh, uh, process. And the TCA, I think one, one area is where it was very disappointing is it does very little to promote short term labor mobility between the UK and the EU. And you know, when travel restarts, we will start to see what an impact that has. But I would hope that would be an area where we could be more ambitious in future about getting a better deal that would help promote some, some of these forms of services trade. Thanks very much, Thomas. And, and coming to Vicky, as, as well as just maybe briefly adding to that, if there's anything to add, Thomas has been pretty comprehensive. I wanted to ask, what do you think will happen to the number of firms which trade with Europe? Do you think that the declines will be significant as a direct result of this? What we have already seen is that it's small firms that are particularly affected, whether you talk to the food and uh, and uh, um, food and oh, no, the trade federation anyway, Ian, that Ian uh, Wright uh, runs. Um, which was on farming today, this morning, so I can just vaguely remember what was said, um, where uh, he did say that it was, it was a small firms that were uh, particularly hit by this. And my main worry about getting out both of the pandemic and as a result of Brexit is that what we end up with is a lot more concentration. So bigger firms have been able to do, uh, you know, afford the costs of rearranging their supply chains. They have been able also to hire the right people to do all their paperwork for them. Um, and it is the smaller firms that perhaps will either go out of business or stop exporting. And that's a real issue. So if we end up with a lot more concentration in our various sectors, then that's gonna be negative actually for the economy as a whole. And is it too soon to put any kind of figure on, on the number of, of firms that are likely to be affected? You think? Well, on the trade side, we know that the British Chambers of Commerce have been doing research on that surveys, and they say that nearly half of their members have are having difficulty exporting uh, the, the, the ones that export to Europe, of course. Remember that we still are talking about a relatively small percentage of firms that actually export. Uh, but nevertheless, they're all affected. We must remember that quite a lot of firms are affected by what comes in as well. So input costs going up because of all these issues happening. So even if you're just importing, then you're suffering as well. Again, the bigger firms are able to do that a lot better than others. So um, it, it does not mean that they're all going to stop exporting forever. Uh, and in fact, only a small percentage say at present that they're not going to bother exporting to the EU. Uh, but they need to wait and see what the issues are gonna be and whether they get resolved. So I'm afraid we can't put a figure on it, but the trend is one which says small firms most affected. It's bigger ones have been able to shoulder the changes, including of course, in the financial sector, not just in food and drink. It was the Food and Drink Federation, I just suddenly yeah. remembered, apologies. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Julian, I wondered if you would accept the, 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 the conclusion that small businesses, particularly in food and drink are going to be um, severely affected by, by oh, uh, absolutely. I, I, I would. I mean, that's something that I think we can uh, we can agree on that you know bigger companies are, are a much better place to deal with regulation, red tape, and and so on than, than smaller companies are. So I think that's an absolutely valid concern. And uh, obviously, the government needs to continue prioritising pro providing more support to to small and medium enterprises, in particular in dealing with, with red tape and understanding what the, the new rules were. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why there was such a big hit actually, of course, in, in January is that you know, businesses didn't really know what they were preparing for. It's all very well saying, you know, get ready, Brexit is coming, but what does Brexit actually mean? So I think that that's absolutely a, a valid concern. Um, in terms of the impact of, of, of non-tariff barriers, I've, I've broadly split them into two types. There's one type of non-tariff barriers is, is an outright ban on doing something, which of course no, no company, big or small, can, can get round. Um, and I think a lot of the emphasis there is actually on the, on the EU uh, making the unilateral decisions, for example, um, you know, mutual recognition of professional qualifications and so on. Um, I think that will come. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if it, it doesn't really make much sense for the EU itself to harm its own economy by preventing uh, the free movement of professionals and things like financial services between us and, and them. So I think the ball is largely in the EU's court there. 
Um, the other type of non-tariff barrier is the, you know, the red tape, the frictions, the, 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 the paperwork, all that sort of stuff. Um, well, I think that's largely down to us to, to sort that out. Um, now, that's partly a process of, of time, uh, but it's also investment in technology, you know, making sure we've got enough customs experts, customs agents, you know, infrastructure of all sorts of types. Um, I suspect that that type of non-tariff barrier will also diminish in importance over time as technology improves. So um, although non-tariff barriers are, you know, potentially more damaging than tariff barriers, I think they're both, there are reasons on both sides to expect those to come down, that the EU will be more flexible uh, and we can invest more to make sure that our own companies can deal with the paperwork and so on more easily at a lower cost. In the 30 seconds I have left, can I just quickly ask you whether you think that there's likely to be a, a chilling effect on, on, for example, environmental standards um, as a result of, of, of trying to get around these non-tariff barriers? Uh, well, I, I see no evidence for that. I mean, the, you know, the, the current government has, has committed to continue maintaining high environmental standards, and I, I don't see any reason to expect that to change. So almost just quickly on that. I mean, I don't have a strong view either way on that. I mean, I think probably the, the, the government is going to, is, the decisions the government makes on that are probably not going to be primarily influenced by trying to affect non-tariff barriers one way or, or, or the other. I think it is a big enough issue in its own right now that it kind of has its own, own momentum separate to the Brexit process. Okay. Vicky, very, very, very finally. I would say that there is uh, no room for manoeuvre, I think, on environmental standards. I think the government is going to have to simply comply with whatever is expected of them if they want to carry on trade. Mm. Okay. okay. Right. Thank you. Caroline, thank you very much indeed. Um, Stephen Farry. Stephen, thank, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my slot with uh, Aidan Connolly. Uh, so, uh, very short answers, if possible, please, uh, folks. Um, I will try and rattle through a fair bit uh, under the uh, in relation to Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Protocol. I appreciate it's very early days, uh, so it's difficult to provide definitive answers. But I just want to get a sense from uh, the witnesses as to how easy or otherwise it's going to be to analyse the differential impact of the TCA in relation to Northern Ireland due to that uh, different um, landscape. I mean, thinking of factors such as the impact of the RSC checks and the, the difficulty, for example, on uh, food movements uh, in particular, but also the fact that the problems that arise if Great Britain is purely used as a distribution hub for manufacturers, uh, but not um, but where there's no processing taking place. And, and then you have issues around potential complexities in terms of access to UK future trade agreements. Um, against that, there's also the argument around the um, Northern Ireland potentially having some comparative advantage in terms of having unfettered access to, to the EU market in terms of goods and also then to, to Great Britain. So um, let me start with Julian and then Thomas and then Vicky. All right. OK. Um, well, yeah, no Northern Ireland has... As many people warned before the uh, before the Brexit referendum and afterwards, has has, has proved to be a, a major stumbling block in in making Brexit work. Um, and I'm certainly not going to uh, underplay the the problems there, particularly in the light of the of the riots in Belfast over over the last few weeks. Um, we we can debate separately how much of that is was an inevitable part of of, of Brexit and how much of it was was you know, the consequence of the the Northern Ireland Protocol. But um, I wouldn't want to in any way downplay the impact that, that it's had. Um, in, in terms of, of, of measuring it, um, and there are various things we can look at. For example, there are sort of regional purchasing managers indices that are published. So these sort of surveys of, of business activity. And it has been noticeable how you know, the Northern Ireland indices have, have, have struggled, both in terms of you know, current conditions and, and expectations for the future. So I think that there's no doubt it's having a negative impact on the, on the Northern Irish economy. Um, Looking forward, I would hope, though, that the arguments I've made about the UK as a whole would apply to Northern Ireland as well. So in particular, things like, you know, streamlined customs arrangements. So, so the reason why we have, of course, a, a border in the, the Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and, and Great Britain is because the EU is not happy with whatever border arrangements there might be between the north of Ireland and, and the Republic. If we, can, if we can progress things there a lot more quickly, um, then I think that will allow us to, to lift the border mm -hmm. in the Irish Sea more quickly. Um, and of course, you know, everything else is, is still up for grabs 
in Northern Ireland, just as it is in the UK. So, you know, any, any part of the Northern Ireland that's dealing with the rest of the, of the EU would, would hopefully also benefit from an easing of uncertainty around the impact of Brexit on the United Kingdom as a whole and uh, return of business confidence. But I, as I said, I, I'm not going to in any way downplay the problems that Northern Ireland is facing at the moment. Yeah. Thanks. Thomas? I just want to make a quick point in terms of kind of measuring the impact, which is that we do not at this point have good data on exactly what is traded between Britain and Northern Ireland, simply because governments don't typically collect high quality data on trade within countries. Now, the implementation of the border in the Irish Sea, the, the customs checks that are carried out there, if nothing else, what that will do is create a lot of data about what is going on across the Irish Sea. And for understanding the impact of the protocol, it would be very helpful if that data is published and made available to uh, researchers. I don't know whether that whether the government has any plans to do that, but the, the quality of the work we'll be able to do on the Northern Ireland pro Protocol will be much higher if we do get that kind of detailed data on how that trade is um, evolving. Thanks. Vicky, thanks. Um, well, I would say that uh, perhaps this is a very good example of where uh, you know, looking at how you export to properly to uh, a region which is still in the EU is likely to be affecting trade. So it's almost as if we, we're running a, a, a controlled experiment and we see what the impact is. I think it has not, it has been much clearer looking at Northern Ireland, what the issues are, than it has been just with trade with the EU more generally. Um, and the reason for the government um, unilaterally suspending checks uh, into from uh, GB to Northern Ireland has been uh, you know, one of the uh, contested points by the EU, uh, but it also shows that indeed they are uh, worried about the impact that that will have. So you couldn't have a better sign of it being problematic than that. Th thank you all very much. I'll hand over to Aidan now, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and again, thank you uh, for your time. Um, I'm going to look at things as far as uh, Northern Ireland's concerned, but in the wider uh, TCA sort of bracket. Now, the TCA is particularly light on services and on SPS. My question to you is very simple. Would it be better uh, for the UK and for Northern Ireland in particular if we had a comprehensive SPS agreement and if we had a more comprehensive uh, service uh, agreement uh, with uh, the EU and um, would that remove a lot of the frictions would it make trade easier and would it have a positive economic impact uh, particularly in Northern Ireland Julian I'm going to come to you first then Vicky then Thomas please okay my answer is yes but um the the but is obviously what does that mean in practice if that simply means accepting all of the EU rules in in, in those areas um for now and and forever, then arguably that that is not Brexit. Um, it's not taking back control of uh, rules, regulations, borders, and so on. So um, I think you'd have to accept that if you were to go down that route, you would be paying a price. Now, uh, and it's not just you know, if you like Brexiteers like me who will be saying that, but if you talk to to people in the City of London, for example, including senior people in the Bank of England, they'd say that. You know, the UK shouldn't be a rule taker when it comes to financial services. And I'm sure that applies in, in other sectors as well. Um, so it, it depends what aligning yourself more closely or continuously with EU rules means in practice. Um, if it's a more flexible form of alignment, you know, sort of, you know, mutual recognition, um, rather than having to have exactly the same rules, then, then, then it's no longer a yes, but it's an absolutely yes. And there are whole sorts of areas. I, I, Vicky's actually mentioned them already, things like mutual recognition of professional qualifications and, you know, an EU decision on equivalence in financial services and th those sorts of things. Um, that I think would be unambiguously positive. That's, that's a win-win for both sides. But if it means remaining tied to the EU rules, then I'm afraid that's not Brexit. I think we're, we're our sort of concern is for the Northern Ireland consumer, they have half the discretionary income of great British households. So any of this friction equals cost, which which affects them. But I, I do take your point about the uh, the flexibility being uh, a key on this. Vicky, please, if you don't mind. Well, my, my answer is yes to, to your question, sort of uh, very, very simply. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think the, the question of mutual recognition, we need to bear in mind, uh, yes, perhaps we can achieve some of that, but as a third country, we 
gave up on mutual recognition. We knew all along that that wouldn't happen, certainly not in financial services and certainly not in other areas, but uh, maybe on qualifications, it can happen in some select areas, it can happen. Uh, but a more comprehensive agreement is, I think, where we absolutely need to iron some of those differences out. Thank you very much, Vicky. And Thomas? To be very quick, I mean, yes, I think, I mean, particularly for the SPS agreement, the benefits of that would far outweigh the costs if a cost-benefit analysis was done. Great. Aidan, thank you thank uh, very you. much indeed. Um, I'm now going to turn to Liz Savile-Roberts. Liz. Thank you very much, Chair. Forgive me a tiny preamble now, but um, I think we're all of us very aware that there's a specific issue in relation to Northern Ireland, and we've touched on that. But I'm also interested in looking at how the TCA affects um, nations and regions, and evidently particularly with Wales. Now, forgive me, just the preamble is, having looked at Welsh Government's analysis of HMRC regional trade and goods statistics, it shows that um, Wales experienced the biggest decrease in good exports last year, 24.4%, compared to West Midlands, 228 Scotland, 21.3% drop. And yet, um, Wales is most dependent of the UK nations on exporting to the EU. 58.1% of Welsh exports go to the EU, compared to 481 So we've seen this drop, and we also, against that, the background is that um, we don't have an, a, a high uh, trade product diversity. 23.4% um, of Welsh exporters are exporting only one product and 74.1% of them, percent of them, forgive me the detail like this, but they are micro or small businesses. And we've already touched on the vulnerability of small bus businesses and their lack of, of capacity. Right, so having given that preamble, my question to you is, how do you think the TCA is going to impact on jobs or wages across the nations and regions and I obviously I'm particularly interested in Wales but I think we need to take the step back from looking at it as being a, a UK wide uh, spectrum because this will affect different areas really quite differently. Could I start with Julian please? Well thank you thank you for that detail I, must admit, I hadn't focused uh, much on on Wales what, what you say is is very interesting um, I, I think inevitably as I, I said earlier in response to a previous question anything that changes trade relationships will, will have impacts on, on, on different sectors and, and different regions that, that vary a lot. Um, there will be clearly you know, some sectors and regions that in the short term will lose, but potentially in the long term can, can gain. Um, I need to know a lot more about what those micro businesses in, in, in Wales were, were doing um, to have a sort of strong view about where the future opportunities might be. Um, but we do have a reasonably effective you know, safety net in this in the UK in terms of you know regional transfers and uh and and you know business support schemes that you know weaker uh weaker companies can can benefit from and if more of those weaker companies happen to be in Wales then we'd effectively be more channeling more support to them during this uh during the transition period so I would hope that the government has mechanisms in place that already will help to support companies and households and individuals to to adjust um in terms of you know the the, the medium to to longer term impact of this, um, I guess in that sense the the difference between Wales and the rest of the uh, rest of the country may not be that great. I, I didn't you know write down your numbers, but actually they, they didn't sound enormously different from from those in the in the rest of the world, in particular the rest of the EU. Sorry, start again. Rest of the UK. Um, I mean, some of those falls were only a few percentage points apart. And that, that could almost be a rounding error in the bigger scheme of things. So um, I, I, I would hope that there are enough support mechanisms in place that Wales would disproportionately benefit from if it is disproportionately hit. But beyond that, it's not something I've looked at in enormous amounts of detail. OK. Do you think that we should be looking in more detail at different regions? Because on the ground for those businesses, that's the effect they're going to experience. Um, well, I'm, I'm wary of that because that, that partly seems to assume that you want to cement in place the current structure of, of whatever the economy is at the moment. I, I think, tend to think it makes more sense to think about supporting sectors. And, and if, for example, there's more, I don't know, certain types of manufacturing or agricultural exporters in Wales, then, then they will benefit from that. Um, I'm a bit wary of targeting support specifically on Wales, for example. 
um, because I think that might tend to cement whatever industrial structure there is in Wales already. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit wary of going down that route. Um, I think Northern Ireland is clearly different because Northern Ireland is facing a different structural problem than, than, than Wales is because the rules are different. But um, I, I wouldn't necessarily target more support on Wales per se. Um, but if more manufacturers who are suffering happen to be Welsh or more farmers who are suffering happen to be Welsh, then hopefully Wales would benefit in that way anyway. Thank, thank you very much, Julian. Um, Vicky, again, that Julian's comments about supporting sectors and about, uh, I think I think we've all of us touched on, on the size of you know, these micro businesses, the SMEs, how we support them. But again, looking at it from a regional point of view, regions and nations of the United Kingdom, forgive me, with the exception of Northern Ireland now, yeah. could you? Uh, all the work that was done on the impact of um, uh, Brexit in the long term suggested that all regions would suffer. Not uh, significantly differently, by the way, but that they would all suffer. The only thing I think that has not perhaps been looked at is the composition of the firms in different parts of the UK. Uh, and the, um, the interesting thing about this is that if you have many more micro businesses that export, then uh, you know you would assume in any case, and that's I think what we can see from the national statistics, the micro businesses profit margin is quite are quite small, uh, and that anything that you do to add costs to those uh, extra costs to um, uh, those businesses, whether it is uh, because the need of these customs agents to be doing various things, or uh, there is a lot uh, less. Uh, ability to tackle all these checks that are happening anyway. Uh, so things take longer and you are dependent on, on quick delivery for the other end, or perhaps you're importing and you're depending on, on something coming in that goes into your own little supply chain, whatever that may be, then you're likely to suffer a lot more. And that's what the evidence we have so far uh, in relation to trade seems to be overall for the UK, so micro businesses, and therefore, you know, if you're only exporting one thing and then um, uh, you are affected by uh, perhaps extra costs, then you will be affected more than others. The government has accepted it, and that's the interesting thing, because there is now an extra fund that's been put aside to help small firms that are having difficulty uh, cover some of their costs. Uh, first of all, sort of training and also uh, perhaps, you know, subsidizing some of the costs that are out there. So I don't know exactly how it's going to work because it's relatively new uh, in terms of exactly where that some of that money goes within the business. Uh, but the fact that they have already announced this extra help, which was anything that it was originally 20 million, I think it's gone up, um, isn't anything like enough, frankly. Uh, but it does suggest that there is a concern there. So yes, I think you, you should be worried about the impact on the region. It needs to be looked at, in my view, a lot more uh, in the sort of micro level than has been the case so far. Okay. And, and Thomas, if I could just bring it back to the, the more general point of the question rather than the Wales specific. If we're starting to look at this in terms of jobs and wages, are there any indicators in terms of job gains, job losses, and where wages are likely to be going? I think we don't typically expect changes in trade policy to have substantial effects on overall employment or unemployment rates. What you do see, though, is that there, you know, changes in trade policy creates winners and losers, and that leads to churning in the job market where you know, the, the firms and the sectors that are most exposed, jobs will be lost in those sectors and other sectors will expand as a, as a result. So even if that doesn't lead to an overall increase in unemployment, what it does do is create a cost for the workers who you know, were unlucky enough to be working in the sectors that are most exposed. And you know, that's when you then have the conversation about how uh, you know, adjustment assistance or support for those workers should be targeted, whether it should be done sectorally or geographically. Um, and then just to kind of link to the wages point, you know. Overall, I think a good rule of thumb is that changes in, you know, average wages for the country will are likely to follow changes in average GDP to a first approximation. So if, if we think that GDP per capita is going to fall by 4%, that would imply that real wages are also likely to fall, fall by 4%. But there will be a lot of variation in the effects with, again, the, you know, the firms and the sectors that can't export to the EU anymore or kind of can't import those you will see bigger wage drops for workers at those firms and you will see other workers that you know benefit from new opportunities so there will be a lot of a, a lot of variation there okay liz thank you very much indeed um i'm now going to turn to roger gale roger thanks very much indeed 
I'd, I'd like to go back to the losses and gains equation, please. You touched on some of this earlier, but what I want to drive at is there clearly have been some losses in terms of business with the EU. D differences of opinion over quantity. Justin, you said very clearly that the benefits of Brexit have been underestimated. And you also said that the likely growth would be in the rest of the world and not in the EU anyway, irrespective of Brexit. What I want to try and get a feel for is to what extent the trade agreements that we've already entered into or are negotiating, thinking in terms of Japan, for example, are smoke and mirrors and just a rollover of something that we had through the EU anyway, and to what extent they represent gains, real gains, so that there is a serious plus to balance the, the losses of perhaps the small businesses. Can you touch on that and then maybe we'll try the others as well? Thank sure. you. Um, well, so just a bit of a, a preamble. And one, one of the difficulties that we've all faced when modeling the economic impact of, of Brexit is that the uh, the costs are, are are fairly immediate and visible and and relatively easy to model. So that's the impact of increases in in trade barriers with uh, with the EU. Uh, whereas the benefits are um, even you know, even if they might potentially be larger, you know they're 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 less visible. They take longer to come through and they're they're harder to to measure. So um, I fully understand that you know one of the, that's one of the reasons why many of the studies have suggested there's some sort of big negative impact is that the costs are easier to to quantify and upfront compared to the compared to the benefits um as far as your specific question on the uh the the agreements that have been rolled over um yes i mean that they are essentially the same as the agreements that we had um, as a full member of the EU. There were some some small improvements in, in, in certain areas. I'm sure the Department for International Trade would want to emphasize them. But the, the bigger picture is that they are they are pretty similar agreements. Um, it partly depends on what you were measuring that, that relative to. Remember, a lot of the more pessimistic studies of, of Brexit assumed that we wouldn't actually roll those over or that it would take a number of years to do. So uh, relative to what some people are expecting, the mere fact we've been able to roll over their agree those agreements is, is an improvement. Uh, and that feeds back into what I was saying about how, you know, since the referendum, there has been a lot of uncertainty about what Brexit would mean and that's held back investment. And part of that was fear that we would lose, lose those agreements. Now we've actually been able to roll them over. I think that is an important positive relative to what some people were fearing. I think that's one of the factors that's feeding into an improvement in, in business sentiment about Brexit, because it's proving to be nowhere near as bad as some people feared. That's, that's a nice optimistic approach. Um, Vicky, can you try and be as optimistic and see if you can highlight where the gains are in terms of any international agreements that we've entered into? It's very difficult to find any serious gains. I mean, the good thing is that we've been able to roll them over, as, uh, as Julian is saying. At least we're not going to be suffering from that point of view. Uh, there's still more to do. We haven't finished. Um, the question is whether we'll be able to strike any new agreements. We are already talking about joining all sorts of trade partnerships that are further afield, uh, which might enhance perhaps our trade um, uh, sort of prospects for the future. But with a number of the countries that are already uh, that are in those wider partnerships, some in Asia Pacific and also uh, Latin America, we already have agreements with, um, free trade agreements of sorts. So it's not actually going to add anything very much uh, more. I think the one that would really make a difference would be if we do something with the US, but we already, of course, sell quite a lot to the US. The chances of having an agreement uh, with the US isn't very great. And in any case, it would require us doing something quite major in relation to our uh, standards, um, environmental and others. What we're seeing instead, even though it's been complicated by sanctions recently, is that the EU has gone forward to have a cooperation agreement in relation to investment uh, with China that would have really opened up um, quite a lot of potential extra uh, relationships between the two blocks, if you like, if you consider China as a block. Uh, we may be missing out of that. So what I worry about is the extra uh, trade agreements that the EU may make or even investment agreements, which would be very beneficial for firms in Europe that we may miss out on. So there is an issue about the longer term from that point of view that we 
perhaps will not participate in, in those, and that would be a real loss to our competitiveness. Thanks. And Thomas, finally, are we winning or losing at the moment? So I, I am very sceptical that uh, trade agreements with countries outside the EU, EU will do much to offset the costs of Brexit. And there's two fairly simple reasons for that. One is that, you know, we, the EU is by far our biggest trade partner. So even if we were to do a deal with the US, trade with the EU is currently around three times higher than trade with the US. And, you know, the, the more you trade with a country, the more you have to gain from the trade agreement. And then the second point is that the, the type of trade agreements we're potentially discussing with other countries are, do not, are not as deep. They do not go as far as the EU does, as the deal we have with the EU did through the single market and the customs union. And the shallower a trade agreement is, the fewer the benefits it, it, it brings. So I just don't think that there's very much scope for getting macroeconomically important gains by doing uh, trade deals with the rest of the world, which is not to say that they shouldn't be pursued. There are some potential benefits there, but they are are small relative to what we think the costs of leaving the EU are. And finally, um, anybody can have a crack at this. I've got one minute left, which means you've got one minute left. Um, okay. In terms of the small businesses that we know are taking the hit, and we all know that, we can see it in our, in our local businesses, that, that those that are exporting are finding it very difficult indeed because of the bureaucracy involved. Um, is there anything in any of this for those small businesses in the wider market that you think we might be able to secure? Uh, the, kind of one of the first facts we teach our undergraduates about international trade is that it's something that's overwhelmingly done by large firms. And that's because the, the kind of costs of setting up an international distribution network yeah. are so high that unless you're, you know, very a very large firm and very productive and selling a lot of stuff, they're just not worth um, bearing. And you know what the kind of depth of integration in the EU single market did was reduce those costs to the point that some smaller firms thought it was worth trading with the EU. For more distant markets, it is going to be very hard to persuade many small firms that it is worth their their investment in those those markets. So I think trying to find a route for small firms to replace lost business with the EU with the rest of the world is going to be very difficult. Thank you very much. Okay, indeed. thank you very much indeed. Uh, Roger, uh, Jeff Mackey. Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to bring an industry voice to this session. Uh, if I could just follow on from the last question, for those of us very much at the sharp end of industry and business, we're very aware that modern trade comes from being part of closely integrated regional and global supply chains. I wonder, would you like to comment on what you believe the likely impact of the TCA has been to date and frankly will be in the future on these supply chains? And by the way, I was also thinking about IP and people as well as materials. Uh, could we start with Vicky, because you mentioned just in time challenges, please. Well, we've seen through the pandemic period, of course, is that supply chains have been disrupted anyway. So the the interesting thing would be how we can disentangle what's happening with Brexit and what has been going on because of the pandemic. But we had already seen uh, a, quite a considerable change taking place since the referendum vote. So those patterns may well continue. Uh, and that's the real problem. We talked earlier about uh, the manufacturing sector and the car industry in particular, where, of course, supply chains are so important. And we know that one part from the automotive um, process uh, that goes into manufacturing travels on average six times across the EU and back, um, or has done in the past, before it gets put into the finished product, which then eventually gets um, also shipped across somewhere. So uh, that uh, has already been disrupted and is likely to be disrupted increasingly if some solution isn't found. And, and of course, the just-in-time uh, issue, it takes two things into account. Well, you'd know that a lot better than me, um, but it takes the, 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 the competence and productivity of, the, of whoever it is that's producing that uh, bit of the supply chain that you need. That could be in China, it could be in Europe. Uh, and also, of course, uh, with it, the cost uh, a, of producing it, and B, of transporting it. And if any of these uh, factors are interrupted, then obviously it affects the supply chain uh, 
uh, process as well and the willingness to uh, really engage with either supplying things from the UK elsewhere or UK companies bringing things in from elsewhere. So you basically become less productive and uh, in the process also less competitive and that really matters. And, and I think Julian mentioned the, the exchange rate and how it had gone up and that was a sign of confidence. Well, in a time like this, you probably need a weak exchange rate, I would say, if you are to compensate for some of those competitive pressures that we're going to have. Um, I'm not an advocate of low exchange rates, by the way. I'm just mentioning it as an aside to Julian's comment. Thanks, Vicky. Uh, Julian, a natural progression onto you regarding the opportunity and how we control exchange rates as well. <laughs> uh, yes, well, as far as the exchange rate is concerned, I, sort of, I, I mentioned that more as an indicator of returning business and, and investor confidence in the UK. I, I don't necessarily think that the rise in the exchange rate itself is a is a good thing because of the potential damage to competitiveness. So I was seeing it more as a sort of you know, a signal of, of sentiment rather than something it, that in itself is necessarily positive. Um, as far as supply chains are concerned, yeah, yeah, I think this is a, a another valid concern. I mean, you know, one of the ways that that trade boosts um, boost productivity and makes people better off is by allowing people to, to specialize, including companies. So, you know, one company in one part of the world is, is better at making a component than another, and then they all feed that into a common good produced in a third country, then that, that's one of the ways that, that trade is good. So anything that holds that process up is, is clearly bad. But I'd come back to the point that I was making earlier that we're essentially talking here about non tariff barriers rather than tariff barriers. And I think that over time, uh, the cost of those barriers will, will reduce as people get used to the new rules, as, as the EU in particular gets a bit more flexible about implementing them as well. So um, there, there has clearly been some additional disruption to supply chains from Brexit on top of what others were saying about coronavirus. But um, I think that disruption will, will diminish over time. I certainly hope it will. Thanks, Julian. Thomas, um, just to pick that one up as regards disruption, you actually commented on the UK not being in a good position to being an export platform. As having the last word on this one, would you like to expand a little bit on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, so we've actually done some research at LSE looking at how new foreign investment projects have changed since the referendum. And we find a couple of pretty interesting things. One is that outward investment by UK firms into the EU has increased more than we would have expected since the referendum. So firms, you know, based in the UK have been looking to set up facilities into the EU. And, it, you know, it's, it's natural to think that that's a consequence of wanting to be able to access the uh, single market without having to go through the customs barriers that are now in place. But at the same time, when we look at flows in the opposite direction, so investment by EU firms into the UK, now you might expect that those would also increase because EU firms also want to be able to sell to UK consumers without having to go through uh, UK customs checks. What we see in fact though, is that those have uh, declined so that there's more UK investment going to the EU, but less EU investment coming into the UK. Um, and, you know, we think the reason for that is that the is the asymmetry in, in economic size between the UK and the EU, so that it is more important for UK firms to have a foothold within the single market than it is vice versa. Um, and unfortunately, that is quite worrying for the UK economy, because it means you know, investment is moving out of the UK, and it's not being replaced by additional investment coming from outside. So, you know, as, uh, you know, as, as Julian was saying, it is too soon to know for certain how UK's position in supply chains is going to be affected. But there are some worrying initial signs that firms are making changes, which will kind of cut the UK off from a, being a major player in, in European production networks. Oh, thank you. Want okay. to explore the next time. Thank well, you, Well, indeed. Jeff, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, the floor now is with Alison Williams. Alison. Hello. Um, so uh, I've got two questions. The first one is picking up on um, some of the discussion we've had already about uh, new trading agreements outside of Europe. Um, and Thomas, you talked about the fact that uh, really this this is relevant for big um, organisations, smaller companies that are not going to be able to afford that that change. Um, but as a kind of general trend, um, what's your view 
on uh, proximity, physical proximity and gravity model being less relevant? And how much was that a, a trend versus being forced through by Brexit? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a great question because it really kind of gets to the heart of where, you know, should your trade policy be about, you know, prioritizing trade with your neighbors or looking uh, further afield, which is, you know, a lot of what Brexit is about. Um, you know, there is a whole kind of cottage industry in international trade devoted to trying to understand the, you know, these gravity models of trade, which say that as countries get further apart, they trade less and whether that distance effect has declined over time. The consensus in that literature is that since the middle of the 20th century, the strength of the gravity effect has been roughly unchanged. So it doesn't seem to have increased, but it doesn't seem to have decreased either. Now, the evidence on that is strongest for goods trade, where we have better data. I think it's a little bit less certain what's going on for um, services trade. Um, mainly just because services trade, trade data typically is very poor quality relative to goods trade. There is some evidence I've seen suggesting that maybe um, the gravity effect for services trade was higher than for goods trade and has declined a little bit over time. But again, I think that's more speculative evidence and there isn't really a strong consensus in that area. But you know, at least I think the, the sort of summary answer to your question would be, we don't have a good reason to think that gravity is becoming less important over time. Julian, would you agree with that? Um, I, I would, with, with one caveat. It's worth saying, of course, the, the gravity model has, has two components, um, distance, but also size. So even if, you know, well, distance obviously isn't changing, but um, the relative importance of the rest of the world is growing as economies from, from the US to to China and everywhere else grow much more rapidly than the than the EU. So even if the, the distance component doesn't change, um, the rest of the world will become more important as um, it grows more quickly than the EU market does. Do you think it's going to have a disproportionate effect on any particular sector, either positively or negatively? Um, well, I think the, the, the goods versus services distinction is the, is the obvious one. Um, I mean, as far as services are concerned, distance matters less in general, uh, but with some important exceptions. I mean, there, there are lots of things where, um, for example, if you, if you hire an architect and uh, something goes horribly wrong, you actually want to be able to walk around to their office and hammer on their door um, rather than try and contact them from, a, from somewhere in India or China or whatever. So there are some services where distance is, is probably just as important as, as, uh, as it is in the, in the trade in goods. But, but in general, yes, services is, is less dependent on, on distance or less sensitive to distance than, than goods are. Um, so as services trade becomes more important, then that's another reason to think that the conventional gravity view that we need to focus on our relationship with the EU becomes less valid. Thank you. Vicky, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yes, uh, perhaps just, just briefly. Uh, but of course, the problem is that service trade is much more restricted than is the case for goods. Uh, so most of the agreements, as I mentioned earlier, do, trade agreements do not really cover services and uh, people, I know, regions protect the services, uh, you know, quite tightly. Um, what we had in the EU is uh, a market where services could more or less, I mean, there were some exceptions because we hadn't quite got there in every aspect of the service sector, could move freely across borders, which is not what happens in any, uh, you know, when we trade with any other country around the world or any other region around the world. So, so it means therefore that the gravity model from that point of view works, but it isn't because they're just next door, it's because we had the, the real common market and single market in that area, well, real, more or less real single market in that area that are facilitated the service sector. So we'll be losing out basically yeah. uh, in any other agreement that we made because we won't be able to translate that anywhere else. And just uh, that leads on actually to the second question, which is around, uh, particularly around services. Um, we talked earlier about non-tariff barriers and the additional cost of that. And um, I think uh, Thomas, it was you, you mentioned that uh, those costs um, will be more easily absorbed by bigger companies. Uh, or sorry, Vicky, maybe you mentioned that. Um, 
I was interested in how uh, how you thought companies might respond to those additional costs of the, the non-tariff barriers. So are they likely to absorb those costs or just look elsewhere for, for that business? Um, and has any of that been factored into kind of long term analysis of, of the impact? Oh, I don't know who you wanted first, but um, um, yeah, Vicky, do you want to go? But it does. Uh, yeah, it does affect companies differently. And uh, the big ones have already responded by making quite huge investments, either in setting up, let's say, warehousing operations somewhere else or setting up. Uh, premises elsewhere and and acting as EU companies because of course that's required of them to to get get accreditation if you like particularly in the financial sector, uh, which has meant moving movement of capital and people at times because you know there are costs involved in in doing this. Well, big firms have been able to sustain this, uh, but of course they've been also hit by the pandemic. So the question is, uh, is is that uh, a viable proposition even for some? Of them who have already done so uh, in the future, but certainly it is affecting their their profits. Um, smaller firms cannot do that. But I think there is a, there is an issue in terms of you know, thinking a bit more positively. What happens in other countries when you look at the supply chain? Certainly, if you look at Germany, is that the the, the big companies that rely on the supply chain from the smaller ones uh, are able to cover some of the costs of the smaller ones, particularly in trade missions and also in setting up the type of supply chain that then is. Uh, cost competitive. We don't do that very much here, although there are some industry people here and perhaps in their companies they do it. Um, but overall, we have a lot less uh, sort of um, uh, support from the big firms for the smaller ones that supply them in this country than is the case elsewhere. And maybe this is the time to rethink those practices and, and support the smaller firms as well. Thank you. I'm probably out of time now. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, uh, Alison. Right, uh, I'm now turning to Alan Winters. Alan, the floor's yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, restrict myself to one question that could talk about it indefinitely. Um, uh, Julian, you mentioned uh, there are lots of opportunities for changes in regulation, but indeed that's what's going to make Brexit worthwhile. So I guess I'd like to ask you what they are, and to be specific as possible, and do you think that the regulatory changes you propose are going to command um, sort of a broad popular support? All right, thank you. Um, well, everybody's got their, their wish list here, aren't they? I mean, I know that uh, my colleagues at the Institute of Economic Affairs could probably come up with a list of 20 or 30 regulations that they'd like to, to get rid of. Um, uh, of That's which I asked probably... about popular support. It, 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 exactly. Um, I think. I, a lot of them, frankly, are, are non-runners. Um, I think the, the way that I would approach this is to, is to stress two points. First of all, I think we should actually go to businesses and ask them what they are most worried about, um, you know, where they see the, the greatest opportunities. And I, I know the, the government has, has made some tentative steps in this direction, but I, th I think it could be, could be bolder in asking businesses what they think the, the biggest constraints are, you know, uh, are in practice. Um, we shouldn't, of course, also forget the, you know, the consumer interest. It shouldn't just be businesses that decide which regulations go, because some regulations clearly protect big businesses and work against the interest of, of consumers. Um, the, the second point I would make is that this is going to be a continuous process. Um, there will be future decisions that I think the UK can make much better uh, in a whole host of areas on its own as a separate nation state rather than as a member of the, of the European Union. Now, um, I know I touched upon this earlier, and I know it's, it, it's controversial and everybody may agree, but I think that the, the faster rollout of the vaccines in the UK is a good example of the benefits of moving away from the EU way of doing things. I think the EU has demonstrated that it's a, it's a clumsy, inefficient bureaucracy. It's, um, it's slow in, in accepting the need for change. And there are a whole host of areas where I think that approach, we could learn the lessons from that in the UK. Um, areas like, for example, the life sciences, so genome editing, all that sort of stuff. Uh, areas like fintech, lots of things we could do much smarter in terms of GDPR and so on. Uh, financial services. There, are, there, are, there are lots of areas. It's hard to come up with a you know, specific okay. list now. But all right. I would be optimistic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Perhaps I can turn to uh, Vicky and Thomas briefly. Uh, I suspect you're going to tell me there are no opportunities, but do you see any mitigations, any anything that we might do now because we have regulatory freedom that would actually be useful? Well, um, 
Alan, you probably remember when you and I both worked for the government, there was this big exercise to ask uh, firms um, uh, to tell us about where the regulations were bothering them and how we can reduce them. And, and although they were always complaining about high costs from Brussels, it actually ended up with not very much at all. Uh, so I'm suspecting that the answer is indeed, you know, almost the, the opposite of Julian. Of course, you can tinker with in a number of areas, and and we are already uh, trying to do that uh, in the uh, area of uh, listings. Uh, we had Lord Hill look at some of the regulations, and uh, we have accepted, for example, now outside the EU that Swiss um, companies, uh, which were excluded from being able to list. Uh, any longer or to trade rather any longer in uh, uh, in European exchanges can come and do that here. Uh, we're talking about allowing those special purpose acquisition uh, companies to be set up here. We're talking about changing the rules in terms of uh, shareholder rights uh, on listings, uh, you know, a little bit like what Deliveroo had done, but actually make them part of the FTSE uh, by changing the regulations. Uh, all sorts of things that that can prove perhaps that post-Brexit we uh, can still have a vibrant financial sector, uh, but they are tinkering. Uh, you know, they're not going to be major employment creation um, initiatives, frankly. So uh, my answer then is uh, really a, a negative one in terms of whatever we do, making any big difference to uh, growth and productivity in the future. Thomas, any quick reflections? I, mean, I, th I think I broadly agree with Vicky on this question. I think, I mean, it's been a striking feature of the economic debate over Brexit, which has been going on for five or six years now, that the, you know, the, the, the main proposed benefit of Brexit is through changes in regulation. Yet, you know, five years on, it's still very hard to get a kind of concrete list of what those changes would be in order to evaluate whether they actually have the the claimed benefits, and I, you know, I think that's indicative of the fact that it is very hard to identify changes in regulation that would bring benefits that are quantif, you know, large enough to offset the potential costs from lost uh, market access. So I'm a bit worried that it's kind of it's it's all it's very easy to say, oh, there will be benefits in future, but there has been a lot less effort to concretely say kind of what the changes we could make that would bring about those benefits and that's that's why i am essentially that's why i'm less optimistic than julian is about how brexit will turn out yep thank you very much okay uh, alan thank you very much indeed just a couple of more questions to, uh, to bring in i'm grateful for our witnesses cooperation paul blomfield thanks uh, thanks very much hillary I mean, i'm conscious we're running out of time and uh, this has been i think an incredibly useful session in framing uh, the work that we've got for the rest of the year um, and I wonder if I can continue in the same theme um, with a sort of quick fire round, if you like, of um, what each of uh, the panel would see as the three key priorities for the UK government in developing the trade and relationship with the EU over the next couple of years. Julian. Um, well, it's interesting you start with the, the trading relationship with the EU, as I say, that I think that's only a small part of the, the Brexit story, but I'll, I'll, I'll run with it. Um, three things. I think, first of all, in the two priorities in the, in the short term, so that's my point one and two. One is to make sure that small and medium sized businesses um, continue to get all the support or, or more than they that they that they need. Um, as we were discussing earlier, there's no doubt that they are struggling more than larger companies, and whether that's you know better investment in in you know infrastructure at the border or customs technology or whatever else it might be, then I think the government needs to needs to prioritise that. Um, the second point is maintaining good relations with the EU itself. Um, I think the the UK government has has done the right thing here, which is to you know, stick to the moral high ground to, to not to resort to the what I would regard as some of the quite petty things that the the EU has has done. So in the area of financial services, for example, the, the way that the, the Bank of England and other UK regulators have been uh, much more flexible about EU companies doing business here than so far the EU has been willing to do there. So I think it's important that the uh, the UK maintains friendly relations with the EU as, as far as possible, not least because a lot of the things that need to 
be done to, to make Brexit more successful are basically unilateral decisions that the EU itself um, has, to, has to make. Um, and then the, the third point is uh, the importance, as I say, of, of not getting too hung up just on the relationship between the UK and the EU, uh, and in particular not to you know, sign any agreements with the EU that limit our ability to uh, take advantage of the, the benefits of, of, of Brexit, whether that's doing free trade deals with the rest of the world or lowering trade barriers unilaterally um, or diverging on, on regulation. So it, it's clearly, you know, Brexit isn't yet done. There are lots of problems that need fixing and it's going to be a difficult balancing act. But I think it's important that the UK doesn't lurch too, ma- too much backwards towards trying to um, rebuild the relationships that we had with the EU as a member of the EU without taking advantage of all the opportunities that Brexit provides. Thanks. Can I just press you briefly on the benefits beyond the EU, which you've mentioned a number of times this morning. Um, The best estimates suggest that in the, what's been seen as the most important uh, trade deal, the US uh, is going to be, uh, you know, between uh, 0.07% and 0.16% uplift. Um, Where do you see these, significant mitigating deals? Well, I, I don't believe that 0.2, uh, frankly, the 0.2% figure. Um, I think there are, there are a number of problems the way that these, these numbers are calculated. There seem to be big asymmetries, for example, the way that um, the cost of an increase in trade barriers with the EU are calculated compared to the benefits of reduction in trade barriers to the rest of the world. Um, I, I think those numbers simply fail the, the common sense test. Uh, And that's consistent with previous studies of uh, reductions in trade barriers. They they often seem to have much bigger benefits to the economies concerned than were anticipated when the initial impact assessments were done. So I'm I'm afraid that that sort of figure just just fails the uh, the, the sniff test, that 0.2% boost to UK GDP from a trade deal with the US just, just sounds plausibly small to me. Something clearly we're going to have to uh, explore in future mm. sessions. Uh, Thomas, your three points. Um, quickly, I mean, the first would be to take steps to kind of mitigate the importance of SPS checks through some kind of agreement that uh, facilitates act, act, access for agri-food. The second would be improved uh, short-term labour mobility um, agreement to to facilitate um, services trade in particular. And then the third, I mean, this is somewhere I do agree with Julian, is to maintain good relations with the EU. As a, as a third country, there will be lots of situations where we are dependent on the goodwill of EU policymakers, and that is far more likely to be forthcoming if uh, our bilateral relationships are on good terms. If I make, I would also like just like to kind of push back a little bit about what Julian just said about the uh, numbers on the US trade deal. I think a range of estimates have been done, but typically the kind of methodology that has been used to evaluate a potential US trade deal and the methodology that's been used to evaluate uh, Brexit and the US deal are the same models. So I think if there is a kind of, there is a sense in which if you think that the US number is too small in terms of benefits, the logical kind of corollary of that is also that you think the EU numbers are too small in terms of costs, because broadly speaking, it is the same kind of set of information and methods of analysis that are being uh, used. Thanks very much, Vicky. Yes, well, I'll, I'll say uh, three things since you asked us for three. One would be to sort out the Northern Ireland Protocol issues, because in fact, if anything, they are souring relationships with the EU, and that's really significant. The second thing is to have a, 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 a way of easing the cost of trade of goods across uh, with all the suggestions that Thomas was making, which I think is absolutely essential because uh, otherwise loads and loads of small firms will just stop trading, but also there will be costs for the bigger firms too. And that, of course, will all pass uh, down to the consumer. And the third is having a comprehensive services agreement, which we don't have, which will also touch, of course, on qualifications. And those are the three musts in my view. Okay. Many thanks. Paul, thank you very much indeed. And we come now to our final questioner, uh, Paul Gervin. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair, for bringing me in, and uh, thank you very much. Now, much mention has been made about good relations um, with Europe, uh, and primarily Europe, because that's what we're focusing on this morning. Um, We very much in Northern Ireland feel that we are being punished uh, in relation to 
uh, the UK deciding to leave uh, and we are being the sacrificial lamb. And the Northern Ireland Protocol, as has been mentioned, has been a major problem. Uh, and the cl clumsy and inflexible bureaucratic monster that Europe has created gives us more checks, not just for agri-food, but for every sector. We're highly dependent upon the uh, aviation and aerospace industry, which is a global industry and means we have east-west uh, materials coming into Northern Ireland uh, to be sent back to the UK after being prepared. What can uh, we as a, a, a group, and I'm, I'm going to ask probably, uh, uh, probably uh, if, if, if you can come forward with uh, Julian probably first, in relation to how we can uh, overcome some of the bureaucratic problems that we are encountering with the Northern Ireland Protocol to ensure that we can move forward and, and open us up to not just uh, Europe, but to the rest of the world. We haven't left. We're still part within the EU. We're rule takers. And as such, we uh, feel very much that we're being punished at the present moment in time. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, first of all, of course, enormous sympathy and I, I think this is something that um, has clearly gone badly and we, we can argue about whether it's the you know the Westminster government's fault for for not you know taking the potential problem seriously enough or it's the EU's fault for for weaponizing the the border or, or some combination of the two but 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 I agree this is this should be you know right near the top of the the priority list if not the number one priority um, in terms of what can be done to, to sort it um, obviously others are better qualified to, to comment on, on on the political aspects of it all but um, the, the obvious economic issue is that you know the EU wants a, a border in place and if, it, if it's not going to be between the north and the, the south of Ireland then it has to be in the in, in the Irish Sea so what, what we need to do is to work out a way of making that border um, operate more more flexibly as, as a land border. So there are a whole host of ideas that have been you know circulating around um, over, over the last few years that uh, various people have been pushing for a smarter border between the north and the south of Ireland. And I, th I think that's where the the focus needs to be. So accelerating the progress towards you know customs border two point zero and trusted trader schemes and and all that sort of thing so we get to the point where the eu is is much more comfortable with the idea that that trade can be managed at the border between the north and the south without the need for physical checkpoints and therefore we can remove the barriers to trade between northern ireland and the and the rest of the united kingdom which are the ones obviously causing all the problems at the moment just just before moving off that that uh, julian and appreciate it uh, there have been many uh, messages going out uh, within Northern Ireland that we are uh, having more checks than with goods coming in from GB into Northern Ireland than the rest of the EU put together. Mm. Uh, and, you know, these are, these are the sorts of messages we're receiving. So are we being punished? Are we being punished as a nation uh, for what has happened? That's what it seems very much like. Yeah, I, I, that's a sort of a political question, not not really for me as as an economist. But I mean, it, it it is consistent with the idea that perhaps the Westminster government hasn't paid enough attention to this, uh, and the EU EU side has has weaponized it. So I think I think there is a there is a problem. Um, there does tend to be a, a bit of a feeling for for some of us at least that Northern Ireland is sort of out of sight, out of mind, and 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 being either neglected or punished or some combination of the two by the by the Westminster governments and the, and the European side. So, but as I said, that's not really my area of expertise, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Can we move on to uh, Vicky, if possible, on the same issues? Um, yes. Um, uh, all I would say, I'm not going to comment on the politics, uh, is that if it all leads to the Northern Ireland economy doing badly and all the problems that we have seen in terms of disruptions and demonstrations and, and the violence that we've seen, then it's not good news. And uh, this is why I mentioned sorting this as my number one priority. So, But even, even companies from the United Kingdom, uh, me in UK, me in the UK, are reluctant now to do business with Northern Ireland. And that's a problem that we are having. Companies which are not even in the agri-food area, which is supposed to be where most of the checks are going to take place in relation to uh, food safety and all of those standards. But the problem that we have, it is, it is impacting on every area of trade. 
areas which have nothing whatsoever to do with that. We have companies who just are refusing because of the additional paperwork not to do it. This is a major downturn to our economy. It has, it has created problems. We have companies who, who went from turning over in December of 2019 just over half a million to January, February figures of just over uh, 100,000. So that's a massive downturn for one small company uh, in the sit back and say, and it's not that they're in a sector that should be having any focus on. It's lack of confidence within business in the UK to actually supply Northern Ireland. Uh, we hear quite a lot of that, uh, there is no doubt. So, yeah. Thank, thank you. And Thomas? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of sympathy for the situation Northern Ireland has uh, found itself in. Um, and unfortunately, there is no silver bullet that is going to solve this problem overnight. I mean, you know, the, the logic that has led to the introduction of a border in the Irish Sea is it's hard to avoid. Um, I think, you know, in the shorter run, an agreement that helped to reduce SPS checks would be helpful for goods crossing the Irish Sea. Um, in the longer run, you know, and this, this clearly is not politically feasible under the current government, but if at some point in the future, the UK were to form a customs union with the EU once again, that would do a lot to reduce the, the checks that need to take place in the Irish Sea. It wouldn't solve all the problems because of single market related issues as well. Um, but you know, there, there, there are policy options that could reduce checks, but they would require a change in kind of the direction in which Brexit has gone uh, so far, and I don't, you know, they don't look like they are things that will happen in the near future, which is, you know, unfortunate for Northern Ireland. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Well, thank Paul, you. thank thank you very much indeed. And uh, your 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 final questions have very nicely teed up our next evidence session, which is going to be on the 29th of April. We'll be looking at food and drink, both across the short straits, uh, but also across the Irish Sea. So we'll be able to explore that in more detail. It just remains for me to thank our three witnesses uh, this morning, uh, Vicky Price, Thomas Sampson and Julian Jessup, for being so generous with your time and your views. I think it's got the Commission off to a great start because you've given us a huge amount to think about, which we will draw on as we carry on our work during the rest of this year. Uh, thank you for coming and thank everybody else for watching. That concludes this morning's meeting. Goodbye. <laughs>